APU. American Public University is proud to present the following podcast. Welcome to today's American University System podcast. My name is Dr. Bjorn Mercer, and today for the Everyday Scholar, we're going to be talking to Jonathan Hill and Indigenous musicians in the American mainstream. Hi, Dr. Mercer. How are you doing? Good. Welcome, Jonathan. And I'm really excited to talk to you today. My doctoral minor was ethnomusicology, although I do not know as much as you at all. This is an interest of mine for sure. So let's just jump into the first question. Great. So what is Indigenous music? And what are some of the popular expectations associated with it? Great question. Indigeneity and indigenousness, as it's become known, and the academy refers to the original inhabitants of a land or people who are thought to naturally arise from the land. And the relationship to the land is primary in that definition. So it's been applied to global populations throughout the world. For my purposes in my study, it refers to the original inhabitants on Turtle Island, what's called Turtle Island or uh, the Americas. Music, as it applies to those populations, covers a really, really broad spectrum. But as it relates to the concept of indigeneity, it refers to music that's been shaped by the experiences of indigenous people. It arises out of indigenous contexts and is intimately linked to the referential terrains of indigenous people. So history is mapped onto it. The land's mapped onto it. Individual experiences are mapped onto it. All those things are integrated, much like with most forms of music. Excellent. Already, I've got a thousand follow-up questions. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but I will wait until we've, we've gone through the questions. And so, excellent. Thank you for that great opening. So the next question is, what made you decide to research indigenous popular musicians? And how did you go about it? My interest was kind of sparked through a series of events. I I suppose this first experience has to do with my father because he's a person of indigenous descent out of Northeast Texas. And he was a musician. He used to cut demos as a part-time session player for a very short time in Dallas for some notable people in the 1950s rock and roll scene. And when I got to know him and about his history, there were a lot of indigenous musicians or people of indigenous descent involved in that. So that was the initial kind of spark to start asking questions about the history of this music, because in the mainstream, you always have these kinds of icons that are held up as the beginning of rock and roll and these kinds of things. But on the ground, it looked a little more complicated. Then the second push came from re-release of Jimi Hendrix's work, and it was an illegal release. The estate pulled it eventually, but he had a rendition of I Don't Live Today from the Royal Albert Hall concert, which at the beginning, he says that the song is being played for the Native Americans. I looked into it more, and I found out that Hendrix had indigenous ancestry and that his paternal grandparents had lived in and on reservations in Canada north of Seattle, across the line, and that those experiences were a direct influence in his music, and uh, he speaks to it. And then the final push came from playing as a touring musician with people out of Oklahoma and Arkansas, and the music scene in Northeast Oklahoma that I was immersed in had all kinds of crossover with indigenous people. There was indigenous musicians there. There were indigenous sound men, indigenous run venues. And the context was very different than how we often parse up populations and people in books and even in mainstream culture. It was this interesting admixture. And I looked more into it. It turned out there was an entire history of people from Northeast Oklahoma who had a huge impact on mainstream music. And so from there, I decided to take a break from the bus and from the vans and get into the academy and start unpacking this stuff. That is extremely interesting. I could see how, of course, if your father played, yes, that would directly influence as you were growing up. <laughs> yep, absolutely. Now, what instrument did you start out on? What instrument did you perfect? Was that your father's or everything like that? Uh, yeah, you know, I got my start playing percussion. And my father was a guitar player. You know, if you look at the eras of musicianship and the skill sets required to pull off certain gigs, 
genre is an important consideration, but time is also a really important consideration. And it seemed that the people that he grew up with were very skilled and they played Western swing, which is essentially jazz music played on folk instrumentation. So his sensibilities about time, beat, rhythm, and all these components were all kind of anchored there. I didn't find that too interesting at the very beginning. So I gravitated towards drums and then made my way to guitar and slowly started picking up jazz and went to the academy for it and kind of honed my talents between there and in a more pedestrian context as well. So guitar became number one. And in terms of research, it's helped me a long, long way to build relationships, to work with other people, to understand the work that they've done. And it's huge in Oklahoma. It's, it's a very guitar-centric state. That's great. So on the guitar, and I'm assuming, correct me if I'm wrong, learning the guitar, and especially jazz, really helps you learn the nuts and bolts and an advanced theory. Yes. And then also playing guitar, you have a well-developed ear. Yes, that's interesting that you brought that up because guitar is really interesting. So there, the theoretical dimensions are really there. You get to get into the mechanics and get deep into it, much like a piano. And actually the modality that I was trained in, ear training and in terms of understanding the building blocks of harmony, was from Charlie Benakis, who was an East Coast piano player that Mike Stern and all those jazz guys went to after they had finished at Berkeley. He was booked out for years. Sometimes it would be impossible to get a lesson from him, but he had a system that worked really well. And I got to know that. And that had a really nice layover with folk music as well, being able to hear harmony, and then to keep up with the social expectations associated with scenes that were really, really developed in terms of their social music sophistication. So oftentimes, if you are out on the research trail, or I was out on the research trail, and you're trying to get to know somebody, and you're asking them about their music, you find yourself in a room where the guy's guitar is there, and then there's another guitar there, and he's like, you can pick that up if you want. No one tells you what key anything's in, and it just rolls on from there. I have a lot of footage of some really nervous moments where I'm relying on my ear. Yeah. And if I'm able to pick things up quick enough, which fortunately happened during the process of doing the uh, research, I could improvise well enough and it would put a smile on someone's face. And then next thing you know, we have an interview, right? So ears are important and I'm thankful for the experience. Absolutely. No, that's wonderful. My background is 99% classical. Yeah. So if you put me in a room with two guitars, I would ask the question, where's my sheet music? Yes. <laughs> which allows me to learn anything, but folk music generally is not always written down. Right. And so from my perspective, it's good to study, but then it's also good to throw away the books and then just to listen. And I love how you said that allowed you then to follow up and talk to people because of that shared experience of playing. Yes. And just making it over the hurdle without the sheet music there. There's a certain vulnerability involved and a certain um, kind of test of competence faith, if you will. And people definitely appreciate it. It's more intuitive and it makes for a nice atmosphere to connect around. Definitely. Thank you. So today we're talking to Jonathan Hill and we're talking about indigenous music. We're going to take a break for just a moment. Today's corporate world requires talented professionals who quickly rise to meet business needs on a global scale. At American Public University, we'll teach you how to meet the needs of domestic or international businesses. Take the next step and apply online at study at apu.com. And welcome back to today's American Public University System podcast with Jonathan Hill, in which we're talking about indigenous musicians in the American mainstream. So, John, the next question is, who are some of the indigenous musicians that have shaped mainstream pop in the American soundscape? And where can you find their recordings? This is an excellent question. And we can cover a broad spectrum of genres in answering this. So you have indigenous people in every pop genre imaginable. What I find the most interesting and the people who are most interesting are the folks who were at the very foundations of American music, oftentimes blues, jazz. These are the genres that are cited rock and roll as well. So you had a huge contribution from England in the rock and roll genre, some of these other genres as well, but more prominent 
with the British invasion, but they were reflecting on and inspired by American music, blues music, jazz, and early rock and roll. So the first person I think that should be mentioned is a Cherokee man by the name of Tommy Alsa, who is out of Northeast Oklahoma in a Cherokee territory. His great grandmother ended up passing away the Trail of Tears, walking over, and had an orphan daughter who later became his ancestor. He grew up playing fiddle dances in Cherokee counties for um, Cherokee people, for some of the settler population as well, and later made his way to Western Swing. He wasn't a reader, but he had great facility on the guitar. And at this time, you didn't have recording and radio and all of these media outlets kind of consolidated on the West Coast. You had a lot of people who had moved out West due to the Dust Bowl, but you still had huge radio towers in Dallas and Tulsa and little record companies, front window record companies on the main strip popping up all over the United States. So it turned out that he eventually made his way into Buddy Holly's fold. And the licks on you know, Every Day and tunes from that album are all Tommy Alsop. He later became the tour manager. He was in charge of rehearsing and paying the band. He almost ended up in the seat of the airplane that crashed that took Buddy Holly's life. But he lost the coin toss. He was the guy. It's not like they had the Buddy Holly story, the movie with the scene completely portrayed differently. It was actually a Cherokee native. And then he went on to become kind of the door through which Leon Russell, Jesse Ed Davis, who's indigenous as well, kind of walked through to become a part of the Wrecking Crew in Hollywood, who produced all different kinds of albums. That Tulsa conglomerate was integrated into the eventual consolidation of recording and the business of it out in California through Tommy also. And he's played on George Jones albums, the last tour, you know, he's playing bass. He produced Willie Nelson's second album. Willie's first album did not go well. The second one did because he orchestrated the musical context to meet a Western swing standard. People have arguments about that all the time saying, is Willie country, outlaw country, or something else? And at his foundations, he's a Western swing player, which is why he's different. Tommy also came out of the same school. He's one of the ground zero agents in developing and producing some iconic rock and roll sounds. And nobody knows who he is, but he's recorded thousands of sessions and has verified credits in around 600 records. But a lot of this stuff was not always recorded by the union or in a contract. Some of it was just walking into a session, and that's actually how he got Leon Russell his first jobs, because he was too young to play and get carded in the union. So they made up names and got him his first sessions, and then he made it in. The second guy who you can listen to and who's easily accessed on the internet and on vinyl and elsewhere would be Jesse Ed Davis, who's a Kiowa guitar player out of the Northeast Oklahoma. He's Kiowa and Creek, and he got his start playing in some rock and roll outfits in Oklahoma and eventually went over to California. And you can see him in Taj Mahal early performances, the first three Taj Mahal albums. He's the guy who played Glass Slide and did the Statesboro Blues solo that inspired Dwayne Allman. Dwayne Allman actually inverted that riff that he came up with, but cites Jesse Ed Davis and the Taj Mahal band as inspiring that. He went on to record with various members of the Beatles, eventually worked with John Trudell, who is an indigenous American poet and activist. And you can find him all over. Doctor My Eyes by um, Jackson Brown. He plays guitar on that. Uh, he's all over the place, but he's an Oklahoma guy too. And there's many more. I could go on and on. Excellent. In generic popular American mainstream, mm -hmm. uh, the representation of indigenous musician is not obvious. Right. Why do you think think that is? That's a great question. So what we expect in the mainstream from um, music that we call indigenous or Native American or Indian, I think there's a couple reasons for it. And if we were to take a materialist avenue, I would look at the treatment of the music at its very beginning. The early record business 
was not a business. By the time they could reproduce sound, that technology had been invented and refined. There were a lot of different ideas about how to treat sounds that you could capture and what it could be used for. For indigenous people, the idea was to salvage culture, so salvage language and music. And for other populations, it was more about pleasure, entertainment, or creating replayable cultural affiliated phenomena for people to enjoy. So ethnicity was built into recording and marketed as such. You know, you had the race record industry that arose that broke big and you could then purchase African-American music and play it in any household. You had hill music, hillbilly music, it was called, which was rural music produced by uh, Euro descent populations. Just to clarify, I believe race music was a term used by Billboard for several decades, correct? That's correct. Yes. It was actually the catalog name. So if you were flipping through any record labels, catalogs that they released, and you're looking for an album, you would have a race records section. That's how they were dubbed. Yeah. And sorry, I just wanted to clarify, um, sure. not everybody's um, honed in on the history of popular yes. music Yes, yes. from yes. the teens, 20s, 30s of the 20th century to today. And um, sometimes when we, you know, we use terms used 100 years ago or 90 years ago, people don't always know that that's what was used. <laughs> yes. Yes. It's an excellent point and great clarification. And it definitely highlights the fact that during this period, people were overtly employing race and ethnicity to mark music and sell it and market it. Some populations made it into that catalog for entertainment and pleasure and still had ethnic designations assigned to them, racial designations assigned to them. Indigenous people did not. The expectation at the time was that the culture was going to disappear and that languages, music, and other features in culture would no longer be accessible. And so the idea was to collect these songs and put them in a museum for the sake of scholarship. And some people's intentions were absolutely to preserve uh, some record of the diversity on Turtle Island. In terms of that, there's over 500 indigenous communities that are still here or recognized more, including those that aren't. But in terms of linguistic diversity, musical diversity globally, there is more in North America, more linguistic musical diversity in North America than in any other place in the world. People became aware of this. And so the idea was, this is going to preserve it. I think a consequence of that is that people don't understand the social role or function of indigenous music or the context that it comes out of. And if they try to apprehend it, the avenues by which they can access it are always historical and have to do with archives and museums. Whereas if you want to learn about what influenced the Rolling Stones in terms of African-American music, there's going to be a CD, there's going to be a documentary made about those connections, about the chess record sessions with Howlin' Wolf and these kinds of things. Excellent discussion. Obviously, we can talk to, about this for, for days. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. Um, and for the last question is, how do you apply this to the courses you teach here at APUS, your anthropology courses? And why is it important for Americans, for every American, to learn more about indigenous music and indigenous cultures? Sure, sure, sure. Excellent question. I think the first application that comes up that it's pretty frequent in terms of the courses that I teach because we ask and discuss concepts like ethnicity. We try to look at the lack of logic and the lack of viability of concepts like race. And we look at their social function historically. We interrogate how we divide up the world, classify people, and how that shapes how we relate to others. And oftentimes in those discussions, people have a hard time distinguishing between nationalism and ethnicity. And we'll often treat things like you ask them for a site one ethnic marker and discuss it. And they have a list and it says it can include language, it can include food, it can include dress, any of these things. And so they'll take food, for example. I've seen this a few times. And they'll say, American ethnic food is like hot dogs or potato chips or these other kinds of things. And your immediate response is, is okay, 
is that really ethnic? Is it really that particular? That umbrella is a little bit too big. We have subcultures. We have multiple ethnicities comprising American culture, right? Some have more visibility than others, but there's always this trend to kind of generalize and homogenize. And examples like these, illustrations like these become a really, really easy way to discuss how people mark culture, how they map culture, communicate and express culture. And it's also an easy point of access because sound, it can be contained. You can't choose if you're a hearing person to listen to something or not listen to it, to click play, yes or no, these kinds of things. But if you've had the experience of living in like a rural context, a place like Oklahoma, and you live away from electrical wires and from highways and the sound of traffic and all these kind of industrialized noises, there are periods where you will hear the sounds of the land and you'll hear people singing, sometimes miles away, uninterrupted. And in a sense, you're sharing the space with those people. You're experiencing it. You may not know what you're hearing, but you have access to it. And I think people forget the capacity of sound to deliver cultural knowledge and how accessible it is in that respect. For some people, I think there's still an issue of having to learn how to listen. I've heard uh, indigenous music described as screaming, chanting, yelling, these kinds of things. And so the way we see the world is very, very culturally influenced. It's very ethnocentric at times, judge relative to our own experiences. But I feel like music has the power to deliver a lot of cultural content through a very, very easy and primary physical phenomenon, if that makes sense. It does. It does. And I like how you're talking about in Oklahoma and listening. I live here in Arizona. Okay. In which there are tribes all around uh, Phoenix. Yes. And it's very easy to be part and experience a portion of that native culture, but learning about it, I feel that the school systems falls completely short. Sure, sure, absolutely. <laughs> Only a superficial knowledge of native uh, history and practices are really taught to people. And if you even that, which is really unfortunate considering here in Arizona, Oklahoma, and around the country, native peoples have a, a federally <laughs> unique position yes. in the country yeah, because their country is essentially within a country. Yeah. And so, and I really like how you're talking food. I think of like uh, my Swedish ancestry and I'm like, try some lutefisk. Yes. <laughs> yes. I wouldn't recommend you trying lutefisk, but <laughs> it's interesting. <laughs> but no, you know, I find this conversation is absolutely wonderful because music connects people food connects people. And there's no better way to understand somebody else besides listening to the music they listen to or eating the food that they're eating. And I love that you talked about music in the sense that when we listen to uh, typical, big old quotes here, uh, Western music, we think of the 12 tones. Yes. But that is a cultural perception. Mm -hmm. And if we were raised in a different culture, whatever microtones that might be yes. used in that culture would be completely normal for us. So if you listen to Chinese music or Arabic music or some indigenous music where they go in between the notes that we're used to, yes, it'd be completely normal for them. And so it's all perspective, which is why I feel like learning about music and indigenous music and culture is so important because in any culture, no matter what country you are, you could just go with whatever is typically taught but you lose out on a wealth of cultural experiences and cultural understanding of potentially your neighbor. Yes. Excellent, excellent points, all of them. It makes me think that we can actually broaden our senses and our experience of music. I'm a fan of listening to the so-called non-Western music. I'm a huge fan of Hindustani music. I'm actually going to go see Ustad Amjad Ali Khan tour with his sons here and they're all three of them are Sarod players and seen them play before they come to UMass once every three years and when you go and you experience what you're talking about these microtones and you walk out from that and if you play it regularly when you start listening to the content that's built on 12 tones and and uh, progressive harmony you start hearing subtleties in there that you hadn't heard before your harmonic and tonal awareness expands as a result. And if you're really lucky, it'll make its way into your playing. That's all great. All excellent mention. 
Excellent. Well, thank you, Jonathan, for um, being with us here today at American Public University System. So we talked today to Jonathan Hill about Indigenous musicians in the American mainstream. And again, absolutely wonderful conversation. Thank you. Thanks very much for having me, Dr. Mercer. It's very kind. I appreciate what you're doing and I'm really, really grateful for the invite. It's great to be talking to a researcher and musician of your caliber. It's great to connect around the folk and the sophisticated, and I really, really, really appreciate it. Excellent. Thank you. And um, everybody have a good day. For more information about our university, visit us at study at APU.com. APU. American Public University.